Promax Highlights. And here's your host, Megan Lee. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our highlight show with the best picks of the week. Here's a look at what's coming up. Perfect promotion. Grumpy Cat is one of the new faces of car maker Opal. Thanks for the memory. A British photographer and his then and now images. And Green Monster, a fast-growing indoor plant, is enjoying a comeback. What do a grumpy cat and a fashion model have in common? Well, they are the current faces of automaker Opal's new calendar. Georgia Mae Jagger teamed up with internet feline sensation Grumpy Cat to promote Opal in a fairy tale themed photo shoot. Well, Grumpy Cat looked like the only one who was completely unimpressed by the event, but we enjoyed getting a behind the scenes look at the action. Beauty and the Beast. Model Georgia Mae Jagger and Grumpy Cat are the stars of the evening. Both of them feature in the new Opal calendar. I mean, I was immediately into the idea because I obviously know about Grumpy Cat from the internet. It's pretty much my favorite sort of meme type thing. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hundreds of guests came to the party in Berlin to mark the release of the calendar to meet Grumpy Cat and Georgia Mae Jagger in person. German fashion and celebrity photographer Ellen von Unwert was also there. She took the photos for the calendar. Capturing an animal on camera is no easy matter, especially one as cranky as Grumpy Cat. But the experienced photographer does have some tricks up her sleeve. I always made sure she opened her eyes. <laughs> and the corners of her mouth turned down naturally. But of course, it's difficult to ensure she's always looking into the camera. And of course, you have to be able to see her blue eyes. But I have my tricks there. I made dog and cat sounds and the like. The result, 12 high gloss photos for the 12 months of the year. The cars rather recede into the background while Grumpy Cat hogs the limelight. Grumpy Cat is actually called Tartar Sauce and was born five years ago in the U.S. state of Arizona. In 2012, her owner's brother posted this photo on an internet platform. The picture spawned countless photo montages catapulting her to overnight internet stardom. Grumpy Cat was born, a unique brand with millions of fans on social media. And now, her very own modeling career. Grumpy Cat is now the world's most famous cat, with over 8 million Facebook fans. We took a look at her, and what we really liked was her crotchety face. We thought it would be really good to have her and Georgia Jagger together. Up to now, car trade calendars were the domain of supermodels and actresses. Best known is the one made by tire manufacturer Pirelli, created by a different photographer each year. German Peter Lindberg was responsible for the 2017 Pirelli calendar, which featured mature women who have made a mark and captured them very naturally on camera. Mercedes, too, publishes a calendar each year, and here, too, the focus is on stars like German actress Heike Makac or opera singer Anna Netrebko. Opal has featured a cat before. In 2016, Karl Lagerfeld's pet and muse Choupette, photographed by the fashion guru himself. This year, it's Grumpy Cat's turn. The idea, to give Opal a new, younger image. She's furry and fun, just like the fox tail on the car antenna back in the day. And Grumpy Cat has a very strong character, sometimes good-tempered, sometimes bad, but definitely full of character. The cat has raised Opal's profile. And the PR plan seems to be working perfectly. According to Opal, the first print run of the calendar sold out in just 48 hours. Grumpy Cat seems distinctly unimpressed by the media circus. She was happy to catnap her way through the event. But what does she make of the calendar itself? Well, if you look at the photos, you can see that it's, it's beautiful. She hated it, though. 
But then we hardly expected anything different from this curmudgeon of a cat, did we? Grumpy Cat's owner's favorite calendar page is December, where the mood is distinctly icy. Spot on for a proper sourpuss. Back in the 1980s, a British man named Chris Ports went around his hometown of Peterborough shooting pictures of the locals. Well, his subjects were everyday scenes and everyday people. Some 30 years later, he decided to recreate some of those images with the same people. Not an easy task, but a pretty impressive achievement. This was Doug and Tina Tarr in 1985. And here they are again, exactly 30 years later. Many years have gone by between these photos, too. They were all taken in Peterborough in Britain. The people in both pictures are the same. They've just changed a bit. The pictures are from the photo book Reunions by Chris Pors. In the 1980s, he spent a lot of time pursuing his passion, photography. I wandered around the streets of Peterborough, just snapping away. Um, and then that just lasted for about four or five years. Uh, and I, I got busy with family and career as a paramedic. And uh, they literally gathered dust. I didn't look after them particularly well. They got scratched. They filed away in shoe boxes. Um, and it must have been nearly a quarter of a century before um, I fished them out again. Horace wondered what had become of the people from back then. 30 years ago, he didn't set out with specific motifs in mind. He let the moment inspire him. He didn't know the names or telephone numbers of the people he photographed, so it was quite a challenge to find them again now. He got some help when the local newspaper published the old photos and asked where the subjects were. People recognized themselves and contacted Chris. Ultimately, he was able to reenact 134 photos. For example, the one of these school friends. Sandra Williams discovered it on Facebook in 2016. I can't remember the first one, but the second one, it, it's really good because I've met my best friend that I hadn't seen for like 40 years. So I've met up with her again. So it's lovely. I never thought I'd actually find you again. I, I thought that picture would be impossible to recreate, but we, we, we did it. Hard work. Hi. Sometimes it was sheer chance that helped the photographer in his search, like with Trudy and Dave Talbot. In 2010, Trudy Talbot recognized her image in a photo calendar Chris Porce had created. The picture was from 1980 with her husband Dave on her 21st birthday. We didn't know it existed until we saw the calendar. And then it was a big surprise to see ourself, well, myself in the picture. And then when I went home and told Dave about it, he was very emotional. To see ourselves back then, how young we were, and now we've got three children and four grandchildren. <laughs> Only the dog is a different one. For many people, the early 1980s are synonymous with wild times and fads. For many people, being part of the rockabilly or skinhead scene was just a youthful phase. Others have remained true to the style they developed back then. This punk rock musician still wears the same leather jacket he wore in 1981. But some things have changed, even for him. Okay, stop there. I was 15 years old, and I was playing in a punk rock band called The Destructors, and I had no money. I could only afford my bus fare into town and to buy new electric guitar strings. He took the photograph when I was going to rehearse with the band. They were special times, and I'm glad that someone was noticing that it was happening. Today, 134 photos of groups of people show how time has passed. With his unique decade-spanning project, Chris Porce captured his hometown's development. His book has moved people all over the world. The pictures display the poetry of everyday life and the life stories of ordinary people. And they brought old friends back together. I never dreamed that I would uh, find any of these people, but to get 134 sets, um, it was really fantastic uh, to see them again after all those years. They were, they were complete strangers, random. I had no contact details whatsoever. And when I met them again, it was they, were, it was fantastic. I, there was hugs, quite emotional, uh, handshakes and kisses, and uh, really wonderful to see them. And they're now good friends of mine. 
Working on the book has rekindled Chris Porras's passion for photography. Now he takes to the streets in search of images again, and as in the early 1980s, he still takes inspiration from chance encounters. Gin, also known as Mother's Ruin, is as popular as ever in London, where it has quite a history. Well, back in the mid-18th century, it was being consumed in such copious amounts that the government there imposed a tax on it, hoping to curb consumption. Well, fast forward a couple hundred years, and gin pubs are still very popular in the British capital. And now the spirit is commanding a hefty price in some corners, thanks to a new boutique culture. There's a new attraction amid the hustle and bustle of Portobello Road in West London's Notting Hill neighborhood. It's the distillery, a hot spot for the capital's favorite spirit, gin. But you can do more than just drink here. The house was opened by London's Portobello Road gin distillery. We want it to be a, a home for the brand, a home for the gin, but also a, a home for gin in London, really. So we've got a, you know, everything you could hope for. We've got a distillery, a museum, two bars, both specialising in gin, uh, uh, a specialist gin shop as well. And, and if you want to stay the night in a distillery, you can as well. So yes, your your one-stop shop for all things gin. Olivier Ward is an expert on gin. He maintains the Gin Foundry web portal, a kind of digital encyclopedia of juniper berry spirits. When he created it in 2008, Britain had about 70 kinds of gin. Now, there are around 600. People have a historical interest in it. It's intertwined with our culture, but it's also, I think, um, today what it's become, like what it's representing today is a progress is all of these new craft distillers and all these new makers that have approached the category in different ways and they're actually putting a lot of creativity into the spirit too so the interest in gin isn't actually just in gin the spirit but the spirit of the makers and the place that it's made this is olivier ward's first visit to the distillery by invitation of jake berger who wants to give him an exclusive tour in the bar on the ground floor the hard stuff is stored in old wooden casks While upstairs on the first floor, the Gin Tonica restaurant serves gin and tonic with more than 160 kinds of gin on offer from all over the world. In this bar, Gin Tonica, where we are now, um, you know, we're specialising very much in the kind of Spanish-style gin and tonic copper serves. And the thinking behind that is that you team a particular gin with a particular tonic and a particular garnish where all the flavours work together. So we wanted a, a wide array of gins for, for this bar. In deference to Spain's rather surprising thirst for the gin and tonic cocktail, Gin Tonica also serves tapas. In Spain, gin and tonic is usually an accompaniment to a meal. Gin and food is probably quite a big trend right now in terms of either cooking with gin or pairing specific dishes. Seafood dishes work really well, so even like gin cured salmon, that works really well. And don't forget juniper as an ingredient goes really well with things like venison. The distillery isn't just a place to drink gin, but to experience it. In the cellar is a little museum. The Dutch prince, William of Orange, first brought juniper spirits to the British Isles in the 17th century. Its popularity spread rapidly. In the 18th century, severe penalties were imposed to keep an epidemic of gin drinking within socially acceptable bounds. Today's gin bears little resemblance to the cheap hooch of those days, as visitors to the distillery's gin institute find out. Along with juniper, up to 150 different flavorings and active ingredients may be added. Here, small groups can even brew their very own gin variety. Even now, the workshops are often fully booked. It's quite inspiring to see because uh, that you get completely different experiences and actually different levels in which you want to, uh, that you can interact with both the distillery and the team. So if you really wanted a hands-on, really immersive experience, you can get that. If you just wanted to pop in for a drink, you can have that. If you actually just wanted some food and just hang out with some friends, there's a huge, a huge range of experiences all under one roof and all centered around gin. 
And for guests who've had their fill of gin, or more than, the distillery has a boutique hotel on the top floor. Comfortable, and yet close enough to reach for the next gin at their convenience. The Italian city of Bologna is rich in culture. Over the centuries, it has acquired many nicknames, such as the Learned One, a reference to its university life, the Fat One, referring to its cuisine, and the Red One for the color of the roofs in the historic city center. Well, Euromax headed to northern Italy to find out more. Elegant arcades line the main square in Bologna, the Piazza Maggiore. In all, 38 kilometers of arcades extend across the city, protecting pedestrians from the rain and the sun. The first settlements were established here over 2,000 years ago. In the Middle Ages, wealthy families here each built their own tower. The two most famous ones are the 97-meter-high Torre Azinelli and its shorter neighbor, Torre Garizenda. Roberto Tazzaroni has worked here for many years. I am the keeper of the Azinelli Tower, which along with its sister tower is the symbol of Bologna. My father also worked here, and I'm the first citizen of Bologna to have been born in the tower and not just in its shadow. Piazza Santo Stefano is also fascinating. This square is actually triangular. The Basilica of St. Stephen is a complex of seven Romanesque buildings. The oldest parts date from the 5th century. Bologna is often called the Red City. Giorgette Sabini has studied the city's architecture. She's in charge of the tourism office. Bologna is called La Rossa. Bologna is known as the Red City. That's because most of its buildings are made of terracotta. There is lots of clay in the region. It's a very pure kind of clay that makes the best and toughest terracotta. It was used for the facade of the 15th century Oratorio dello Spirito Santo. Bologna is also called the fat one, La Grassa, because of all its fabulous food. Mortadella is one local speciality. La mortadella, mortadella is made of shoulder of pork and pork fat. It's very finely minced, cooked and stuffed into a natural casing. Of course, bolognese sauce is known the world over. Carrots, onions, celery, fresh rosemary, pork belly, red wine, tomato puree and ground beef. It's done after three, three and a half hours or four hours, depending on how much meat you use. The sauce is never served with spaghetti, but only with tagliatelle. The famous restaurant Donatello observes this tradition. The original recipe is kept at the Chamber of Commerce. And a prototype in gold of the perfect tagliatella. Bologna is not only the red city, but also the learned one, La Dotta. Its university was founded in 1088. It's the oldest in the Western world. At first, classes were held in various parts of the city, in churches and in the homes of the professors. Then, in the mid-16th century, Pope Pius IV came to govern in Bologna, and he built this building, the Archigenasio, as the first permanent home of the university. Not only people from Bologna or from Italy studied here, but lots of foreigners, Germans, Spaniards, French. The ceilings are painted with the coats of arms of those students. The city's churches are full of amazing works of art. Some are now kept in Bologna's Pinocoteca, or National Gallery, including this altarpiece by Giotto that dates from the 1330s. Medieval frescoes tell stories from the Bible, just as the ecstasy of St. Cecilia by Raphael does. Napoleon stole it and sent it to Paris, but now it is back in the city where it was commissioned. 
Bologna has dozens of museums, but the city itself is one huge living museum, with its old palazzi evoking centuries past. In the early to mid 20th century, the Monstera Deliciosa plant was a favorite motif among designers and artists, but then it took a downward turn in popularity and moved from salons into office buildings or teachers' rooms just to collect dust. But thanks to a greener interior design, the Monstera is making a comeback. It's certainly no shrinking violet. The Monstera Deliciosa, or Swiss cheese plant, is a true queen of the jungle with its large leaves and abundant growth. This season's must-have, it features in every trendy apartment right now as the plant's popularity continues to spread. Actress Jennifer Lawrence shared the cover of Vanity Fair with Swiss cheese plants and they adorn a Gucci top. The sustainable fashion brand Greenlee has designed an entire swimwear collection around the plant. And images of its distinctive leaves appear on products of all kinds, from posters to cushions. One Iprestel from upscale Berlin florist's Masano has an explanation for all this hype. It's incredibly decorative, thanks alone to these very unusual leaves, where every one is different. Many architects place them in very austere contexts. Their wild character represents a real break in style. There's this pared-down minimalism, and then along comes this very wild primeval plant and just runs riot. What personally fascinates me about the Monstera is that one leaf is enough. You can just put one in a nice vase, and that's decoration enough for your apartment. The Swiss cheese plant originally comes from Central America. The Polish botanist Josef Waszewicz brought the first one back to Europe in the mid-19th century. This was the beginning of a blossoming career as a source of inspiration for a number of artists. Pablo Picasso shared his studio with a huge monster. Henri Matisse's famous collages were inspired by them. Art critic Zilke Hormann says he was most fascinated by their leaves. What makes the Swiss cheese plant special is its designed look. Its leaves are unique. They have these irregular shapes with cutaways. Looking at them as someone who's interested in form and wanting to know the reason for their appeal, you have to say it's because they're very well made. They look like a well-made design object. Design greats Charles and Ray Eames also had a liking for them. The husband and wife team helped to define what's known as the mid-century modern aesthetic, which is all the rage again. Another reason why the Swiss cheese plant is enjoying a revival in popularity. There are even some blogs exclusively devoted to the monstera and other plants of its kind. The Urban Jungle Bloggers is particularly popular, a virtual oasis for the green-fingered. Judith de Graaf from Paris and Munich-based Igor Yosifovich are the driving force behind the blog. This is inspired by today's hunger for nature. We live in urban environments where green spaces are in short supply. And this is a way of bringing some nature back home with us, of creating our own green spaces. And the easiest way of doing that is with potted plants. That's why they've written a book called Urban Jungle. It's a collection of ideas, a source of inspiration, a handbook for all those who want to introduce more plants into their lives. The Swiss cheese plant gets an entire chapter to itself. What's also popular, an old favorite, the rubber plant. This beauty, the Calathea. What I also really like about houseplants is that they learn you how to be more patient. To bloom, for example, or to grow a new leaf, it takes time. And if you see it every day, you see the development and you have to be patient to see, it, to see how it happens and when it happens. And it's not instant. So I think in these fast times, it's important that we stay in touch with nature. And houseplants is a good way to make nature part of your daily life. And more and more people agree with her. Florist Wani Prestel already has an inkling what might be the next big thing in terms of potted plants. Easy care cacti. And for them, you don't even need green fingers. 
with that, we wrap up another week of Euromax. From all of us here, thanks for watching, and we will see you again soon.